Let's take another breath. Our theme this month is joy. And we're concluding it now on today's joy shapes tomorrow's experience. Today's joy shapes tomorrow's experience. So this time last weekend, instead of being here at church, I was at the close of the IONS conference, the Institute of Noetic Sciences, where I was on the plenary the day before. The Institute of Noetic Sciences um, was started by astronaut uh, Edgar Mitchell. He was one of the ones that was on that first moonwalk. And being out there in space, that infamous picture that we got for the first time, and really getting and understanding that there's just one planet, there's just one people. And he came back and he dedicated his life to the study of what he called inner space as well as outer space. So the IONS group, the Institute of Noetic Sciences, has a beautiful campus. I don't even know how many hundreds of acres they have in Petaluma. Um, And they are a research institute as well. They say inspired by science, but transformed by experience. And what they're all about is bridging that gap between science spirituality, to show how it's, it's all the same thing. <laughs> but without a lived experience of it, it's very hollow. It's very shallow. So they were some of the ones at the forefront of the whole like mind-body connection thing. They work with Stanford and Harvard and a lot of the big, and heart math and a lot of the big places that are doing this work. And I bring this up to say that that the scientists were saying over and over again, you know, including Deepak Chopra, you know, who was there, how what we see is just a fraction of reality. That our bodies and everything is mainly empty space. that what we see as matter or particles is just a fraction, but most of it's waves. Most of it is stuff that we don't even see, we can't touch it. Sometimes they call it the field, but everything is coming up out of that. And if we could understand that we are a part of that, we have this conception of ourselves as entities, We have a conception of ourselves as solid matter. There's life out there happening at us or to us. But we are not solid entities. We are vibrational fields. We are energetic frequencies. We are verbs. We're not nouns. Just just let that sink in for a second. You are a verb. (laughs) You are activity. The very essence of life itself isn't happening to you. It's happening through you. Life is being life in, as, and through each and every one of us. If we could ever let that really sink in, it would revolutionize everything, (laughs) absolutely everything, to understand that we are not at the mercy of external hostile forces that are jerking us around. That's not what's happening. (laughs) We are part of life itself. And breathe for a moment. Every 
thing is a story. Everything is a story. Your experience is not about facts. Your experience is the story you tell yourself about the facts. Your experience is not actually what happened. Because even the definition of what happened is based upon your narrative. <laughs> it's based upon your story. Just let that sink in for a sec. Your story shapes your experience. Our story shapes our bodies. Our story shapes the whole outer world of experience. At every moment of every day, the cells in your body are regenerating. The body you have today is not the body you had last week. It's not the body you had two months ago or two years ago. It may look the same in some respects, but it's not the same body. Because everything is regenerating at every moment of every day. That's how healing is able to take place. Healing is able to take place because as things are restored, as things are reduplicating, as things are regenerating, they always have an opportunity to go back to their more perfect form. Always. We're never stuck with just what we have. There are not different laws for the physical world or the spiritual world. There are not different laws for health or wealth or love. It's all the same thing. The thoughts you have today, if you are thinking today what you thought yesterday, it's not that yesterday's thought came with you today. You're rethinking it today. We're rethinking it today. It's kind of like a trending stream. Okay? The, the more you think about it, it keeps going up to the top. It keeps going up to the top of your trending. And the less you pay attention to it, the less you read it, it slips further and further down the feed till it's like archived, so to speak. And literally, your mind does this kind of dump when we're sleeping. So the energy and the synapses that are, we, we say the thoughts that fire together, wire together, that literally your thoughts create synapses in the brain. There's a neurological thing that happens. That they start to release. So the energy that was using to hold this thought, that energy isn't holding that thought that's way down on the end of the stream anymore. It's going towards the new thought. Where is your energy going? See, where is your attention going? I did a workshop at Ions as well as a plenary right afterwards. And somebody was asking me the question about fear and how do we stay joyful and how do we keep rising above? 
And I quoted them that quote that I love of Audre Lorde. There's a copy of it, a picture of her and this quote in the staff bathroom. I still don't know who found that. At one of our flea markets, somebody found that and hung it in there. It's big. Thank you, if you're in the room. Um, and, and a calligraphy of that quote also is by the side of my bed that was commissioned by Inner Light years ago. And the quote is, when I dare to be powerful, to use my strength in the service of my vision, it becomes less and less important whether I am afraid. When I dare to be powerful, to use my strength in the service of my vision, it becomes less and less important whether I am afraid. And I love that definition of power. To use my strength in the service of my vision. It becomes less and less important whether I am afraid. So what I've trained myself to do through the years is not pay so much attention to if I'm afraid. To not pay so much attention to how hard it's going to look. To not pay so much attention to what everybody else is doing and how much I like it or don't like it, but how am I using my strength? See, is, is, is my strength going towards the stuff I don't even want. It, it, is, is my strength part of the trending of subjects I don't want anybody talking about? But the more I'm talking about how I don't want them talking about it, <laughs> makes that stream even bigger. I'm not saying to ignore it, Talk about something else. <laughs> I don't know why we have this idea that somehow or another it's speak up against things or shut up. No. You don't have to spend all of your time resisting. Use your strength for the power that you want. Use your strength for the vision that you want. We often think of joy as some kind of fleeting experience, that it's a reaction or response to things that have gone on that we have found pleasing. So we make joy very conditional. But I want to say again, don't confuse joy and happiness. Don't confuse them. Hap, circumstance, root, circumstance. Happy is when we are pleased with the circumstances. Joy is transcendent of that. You can have joy and not be happy. You can have joy and not be happy about the circumstances at all. You can still have joy in the midst of mourning and all kinds of loss. You can have joy in the midst of illness and sickness. You can still have joy in the midst of conflicts and relationships that are discordant. Because the joy is always there. It doesn't come, it doesn't go. Circumstances don't manufacture it. It is a constant in the universe. Love is a constant. Joy is a constant. Possibility, power, trust, truth, music. These are constants. It isn't that the joy comes and goes. It's that some 
sometimes we give ourselves permission to vibe with it, and sometimes we don't. <laughs> and most often we don't because in our minds we are making joy conditional upon the circumstances. So we spend more time trying to get the circumstances to shift and to change rather than using our powers as spiritual beings to move up to the transcendent awareness of tapping into the joy that's always there no matter what. And you know what? If you do that, then the circumstances will change. <laughs> We've got it backwards. We're waiting for the stuff to change, to give us the permission to experience the joy that's already there. If you give yourself permission to experience the joy that's already there, then the circumstances around you will change. Why will they change? Because you will have changed. How you engage will be different. What you see will be different. What you say will be different. How you spend your time and your energy will be different. You shape your experience ahead of time. It's not just what happens to us on the back end. The narrative, the story that we tell is in real time. It's not just the report afterwards. But you wake up in the morning with a story about all that you have to do or how hard the day is going to be or what all is missing or who's doing what that shouldn't be. We're, we're, we're already preparing to be sick. It's Monday. You got a call on Monday. And you're already preparing for what you can't do this weekend. We're having arguments in our head. I've mentioned many times I used to be a debater. We debated in my family, like for sport, literally. And you never knew which side you would debate until the flip of the coin. So you always came prepared for either side. And I think that personally has served me well because I listen to everything. And I enjoy being able to see through the other's eyes. I don't have to agree with it, but because I can see it, it can give me some compassion for stuff that I don't even like or I don't even agree with. So what happens for us is that we are, maybe not to the extent that I, would, I used to do it, I used to rehearse arguments before I had them. They're going to say this, and then I'm going to say that. And they're going to bring up this point, and this is going to be my counter. And then I'm going to throw this ringer in there and throw them off. And, do, 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 do. and you know what? I got to have every argument I prepared for. <laughs> I did. And, and when I finally got, what would happen if I didn't 
assume ahead of time there was going to be an argument. I used to be sick at Thanksgiving, every Thanksgiving. And I could even tell people, like, I'm going to be sick at Thanksgiving. <laughs> Until I realized I didn't want to go. I didn't enjoy the experience. And I never will forget this peak moment. I was in the classes with Beckwith. I was studying to be a practitioner. And believing in the absoluteness of the laws, okay? God is all that there is. We're all spiritual beings. I'm a spiritual being. And because I had that debate logic stuff in my head, well, if everybody's a spiritual being, that means my family too. <laughs> Whoa. That was news. Because I kept wanting to get away from them so I could get with the spiritual ones. <laughs> and all these people were in my way. These other people were in my way of my spirituality. <laughs> and I remember that spirit letter saying, you think people are in the way of your path. People are your path. That the people are your path. So I can remember my sort of logical mind. I'm going to do an experiment. I am not going to assume ahead of time that I'm going to be sick. Let's just see what I am when Thanksgiving comes. <laughs> and I am going to consciously, ahead of time, keep telling myself that the people at this dinner are spiritual beings. <laughs> okay? But, but can you see, it's a narrative. The narrative I had before was the narrative that I met. When I walked in with the narrative, these people were spiritual beings. You know what? I actually had a good time. <laughs> I actually enjoyed them. And some people whom I totally discounted actually had some smart things to say. When that happened, I thought about Mark Twain's quote. He said, when I was 13, I thought my father was the stupidest man in the world. I was surprised how much he learned by the time I turned 21. <laughs> and I started to get it. I was making myself miserable. I was making myself more miserable than I needed to be with my narrative, like with my story. You say, well, can you just go around making stuff up? Yes. <laughs> You're doing it anyway. <laughs> You're doing it anyway. You don't know what tonight's going to bring. You don't know what tomorrow's going to bring. We don't know. We are making the story up all the time. Why don't you make up a story that works for you? I don't mean to be insulting when I say this. And <laughs> I 
Life makes so much sense to me when I frame everything within the context of child rearing. Everything makes sense to me then. So that idea like we have an inner child, what would you say to your inner child in this moment? Okay, you're afraid, you're wigging out, blah, 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 blah. If you had custody of somebody who was acting the way you were acting, what would you tell them? What would you say to them? If your child is coming to you with all this narrative, nobody's going to like me, and I'm going to be the one left out, and, and, and I'm not as good as so-and-so, and, 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 and you know, my clothes are funny, and they're going to laugh at me, and da, 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 da. what do you tell them? Cease and assist. Cease and assist. Why? Because we already know that if they show up with that attitude, guess what? That's what they're going to experience. We already know that. So we try to get them to put a different story in their head, a story of possibility, a story of self-esteem, a story of belonging a story of inclusivity, a story of success, a story of companionship, a story of enoughness, a story of joy. Yes? So whose story is more fictional? We don't have any question about this. For some reason, we always understand it works in the negative, but we don't understand how it works in the positive. We know that if you walk around with a nasty attitude, you're going to meet yourself coming. Why wouldn't it be the same? If you walk around with a positive attitude, you're going to meet yourself coming. Why wouldn't it be equally as powerful? Why not? It's your narrative. What are you telling yourself? This is the counter blessing. I didn't get it as a kid. But what my parents were trying to do and the elders was to get me off the nee, 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 nee. Because you can't see. That gets you into a lack of gratitude. And when you get into that lack of gratitude, you can't experience any joy. So if you count your blessings, start taking stock of what has worked. Start taking stock of all that you do have. Start taking stock. Let that be in the front of that feed, see? Then all of the other stuff falls further down to the bottom. But nobody can control the feed in your brain. You're the only one who can do that. <laughs> You're the only one who can get in there. See, we can't take thoughts out. You can't unring the bell. We replace them. We supplant them. So if you don't like what's going on, <laughs> my mother used to speak a lot at the church. She was president of the Women's Christian Council in my Pentecostal church. And I can remember a few things she used to say to us. One. If you don't like the news, make some of your own. Two, she used to tell the kids, we'd all come around the altar, she used to say to us, there are three kinds of people in the world. There are people who make things happen, people who watch things happen, 
and people who don't know what's happening. <laughs> Which one do you want to be? Which one do you want to be? I'm telling you now, your joy is not some far off distant thing. It's with you all the time. We just have to let go of the excuses and the reasons that we give ourselves that say it's not there or that we can't see it. Look for it. Look for the delight. Tell yourself it's yours. Tell yourself it's not just something that can come and go, but it is who you are. You are joy. You are love. You are peace. You are power. You are wholeness. We can't borrow any of this stuff. You can't buy it. Nobody can take yours. You can't have anybody else's. It's just a question of what do you have the bold audacity to stand in and claim no matter what. Have you made that declaration in your mind? Have you made that declaration to live in joy no matter what? H have you made that declaration to be love no matter what? H have you made that declaration to be forgiving and compassionate no matter what? And I guarantee you, if you make that declaration about your life, you will get to experience it no matter what is going on in anybody else's life or your own. Do I have any witnesses in the house? Yes. Yes. I'm not telling you anything new. I can't even tell you something that you don't already know. The best that we can ever do is awaken and remember. We're here to remember. We think of education as putting stuff in, but it's not. That Latin word, I think it's educare, is to bring forth. When you educate, you're bringing something out of the people that's there. You're not sticking things into them. We're bringing it out. And that's our job as spiritual community here, is to help us take the shackles off, to take the blinders off, to take the if I would have, could have, should have, judgment, all that stuff that's making us dim our lights. Because you are more powerful than you will ever imagine. But don't wait for something to tell you that, validate that, prove it, give you the permission, the opportunity. Stand in it. Claim it because that's the way you'll ever know it. The only joy you will ever know is the joy you allow yourself to experience. Emphasis on allow. Let us pray. Let us pray. how sweet it is
How sweet it is to turn within. How sweet it is to know. How sweet it is to be free. To know we're not our stuff. How sweet it is to constantly be beginning again. With utmost gratitude, I say thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Mm. <clears throat> Grateful for all of it, for life, for the thoroughness of the journey. For opportunities, for the twist and the turn. For the valleys are no less wondrous than the mountaintop. As it says in the scripture, the darkness and the light are the same to thee. We dare to be like the sun that makes its light to shine upon the just and the unjust. Cause the sun just shine The flowers just bloom <laughs> Doesn't matter what everybody's doing all around it They just bloom because it's their nature to bloom And so it is with us We shine and we bloom Because it's our nature I say thank you, Spirit Almighty. Knowing how this invisible substance stuff just takes shape and form all the time. And I'm knowing that it's taking shape as all needs met. So in this moment right now, we have the audacity to claim right action and divine order. Healing of the body temples, healing of our financial bodies, our body politic. Anywhere that looks like it's out of order, we're knowing it's just an appearance. Because underneath it all, life is perfect, whole and complete. So we pay more attention to that underlying pattern, affirming that and calling it out, than we do condemning what appears to be all. So we look straight into that body that appears to be diseased and we call for health. We look straight into those relationships that appear to be discordant and we call forth the harmony. We call forth the clarity even in the midst of the confusion. Oh, we are not fooled by the appearances, Maya illusion. Oh no, 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 no. In this moment right now, we know that the divine comes through as all needs met. All needs met. Divine right resident. Divine right employment and, and, and income opportunities. Divine right relationships, collaborations and support. Divine right transportation. When the student is ready, the teacher will appear. When the teacher is ready, the student will appear. So all the guidance and support that we could ever need, we have. In all kind of shapes and forms. Some incarnate and some not. But we always have the guidance for that next step. We may not see the whole picture, but we're never left in the dark. So we have the courage to just take that one little step in front of us. The courage to, to light that one little candle Knowing that the darker it appears to be, the greater 
the illumination from the smallest amount of light. Oh yes, it's good. We speak a word for the spiritual community. Our continued evolution and unfoldment. All needs met. Swimming in enoughness and sufficiency. Divine order and right action. Divine right resident. Oh yes. We speak a word for this nation and for the world. We speak a word of justice. We speak a word of truth. Of compassion. The stewardship of the planet and of each other. Environmental sustainability. We call forth the spiritual fulfillment. so that each and every person reaches their fullest and highest potential. There's only one of us here. We release this word. We know that it's already done. We know it's already good. We just get out of the way. Allow it to be, and so it is.